Okay friends, now we are going to talk about uh, the type of bacteria which are called spirochetes. And among spirochetes we are going to talk about the three types of bacteria as we are seeing here. Is one is a Tryponema, another one is a Borrelia, another, another type is Leptosporia. Uh, and, uh, and among all these different types of bacteria we are going to talk, uh, they are having some general characteristics in common. Uh, and they are also having something in their different, uh, uh, which are differing from uh, each other. Now we are going to talk about major and basically among their physical properties as well as some biochemical features uh, inside their cells and we are going to talk about the pathogenesis uh, that they cause or the diseases that they cause uh, for humans. Okay. Now the object, now, now let us talk, uh, no, let us, this, th in this uh, total uh, discussion of mine, we are, uh, first thing I am going to talk about the main characteristics of spirochetes, among where we are, we are going to see the different types of spirochetes and what are their general features of their cell. And the second thing we are going to talk about the human pathogenic spirochetes, among them we are talking about the morphology, classification and uh, physiology. We are not going to talk about uh, diagnosis and treatment, we are just go uh, going to go up to the epidemiology and, uh, and till there. Because, okay. Now the main goal of our discussion is to learn about the spirochetes, okay, not learn about the diseases. Now there are three types of uh, spirochetes as we know, uh, as we are going to talk. One is the uh, Tryponemus, another one is the Borrelia species. Tryponemus, uh, uh, or Tryponemes cause uh, disease uh, which is called uh, the gonorrhea as we know. Uh, no, Tryponema causes the disease as we know, uh, syphilis. And Borrelia species causes the disease relapsing fever and also Lyme disease. And Leptospira uh, causes uh, different uh, types, sets of disease we are going to see later. Now, the let's first talk about the general feature of a spirochete. Now, as we can see in this picture, the spirochetes are really, really thin. They are helical uh, in nature. So, this is the characteristic shape of a spirochete. So whenever we are talking about a bacteria, as we know, first thing ca that comes to our mind when you look a uh, bacteria in, uh, through the objective lens, through the eyepiece of a microscope, we find something like that, sometimes uh, like this, this round shape. But in this case, the first thing you can see when you look uh, through the microscope, we see a spiral structure like that. And this coil structure is a very, very uh, important characteristic shape of the spirochetes. So whenever we are looking at this kind of structure, and also this bacteria is motile, they can uh, be transferred from one place to another place uh, by using the screw-like uh, motion, we can say the bacteria we are watching is a type of spirochetes. And these bacteria are gram-negative, that means they are having three layers. We are having the inner cell membrane layer, then we have the peptidoglycan layer. Suppose this rigid, this layer is a peptidoglycan. Then uh, upper up a layer of the peptidoglycan there is a layer outside the peptidoglycan which is the external cell layer though the peptidoglycan layer is really really thin in this case but still a uh, peptidoglycan layer can be found in those cases and they are having uh, the flagella for their mortality purposes but the important thing about them the flagella spirochetes provide is having the differential structure different type of structure than the flagella what we can see in normal bacteria now as we know the normal bacteria produce uh, flagella from the inner cell layer and it just uh, go through the uh, uh, process through the inner cell membrane then passes through the peptidoglycan layer and then uh, find the outer membrane uh, and uh, just released outside so if we think about uh, so let me e erase all these inks okay and suppose this is a bacteria so this is a, a one of our bacteria and this bacteria possesses a flagella the flagella will look like this so, so the, if this is a bacterial cell and the flagella come out uh, out from the bacterial cell uh, it will uh, be outside the, uh, it will fa it is going to face the environment like that but if we think about the spirochetes what will happen uh, if you look at the spirochete structure uh, look at this so this is the spirochete structure it's a co co coiling structure like that and uh, let me change the color so suppose this is the coiling structure and what happens in case of spirochete this is the cell of spirochete and so, so from this cell of spirochete if I, if I cross uh, if I say cross make a cross section of the spirochete what we can see we can see some region uh, where also this this uh, flagella is coming out that means so suppose this is a straight chain this is this is uh, the spirochete I am not co uh, coiling this up now now what happens they produces flagella from their inner cell membrane so suppose uh, this is the inner cell membrane so I am 
I'm, this this is the inner cell membrane and this is the outer membrane so i am making it really big for your uh, understanding purposes but not uh, this is not the case so here is also we have we are having so this this is the cytoplasmic portion of uh, this spirochete and this uh, this these are the outer membrane and these are the inner membrane of spirochetes so this this huge region which which i draw in this picture so actually they are not huge but i draw them because of the understanding purposes now these huge gaps are the periplasmic space as we can know now the flagella of the spirochetes usually generates from a region like that so let me change the color again let me take the red color now here we have the flagella coming out from the inner cell membrane and it is just released into the periplasmic space this is uh, periplasmic space instead of go outside the cell so as we can see in case of uh, traditional bacteria that the flagella is generating from inside the cell and it faces the outside the environment but in case of the spirochetes uh, the origin of the flagella remains the same but but its ending point is different it just reside in the periplasmic space so this uh, spirochetes are having a huge periplasmic space in that periplasmic space they are holding their flagella and that's why as we can see in this case so if we think this is the flagella will go uh, in this direction like that so when the flagella start to move and and, and they they just uh, wrap uh, wrap around themselves uh, around the flagella that they can move in a screw like movement as we can as we know that if we take a screw and if we uh, tight uh, them if we make tighter uh, and and it will finally go in into some direction that's how this kind of spirochetes start to move because they just make them just like a screw and they can move from one place to another place okay now we are going to talk about three types of pathogenic uh, spirochetes one is treponema another one is borrelia and leptos leptospira now in among all these three types of spirochetes what we see in common is this uh, this kind of twisting uh, structure of their cell this kind of spiral structure of their cell as well as the presence of this periplasmic flagella which is called the axial uh, flagella okay okay now this is uh, we can see in common but what will vary from treponema to borrelia and leptospira uh, leptospira is uh, that uh, uh, the presence of flagella and the number of flagella that they possess so maybe in case of treponema it is only uh, 3 to 4 flagella in case of leptospira it is only 2 uh, or in case of borrelia it is more than 5 flagella uh, we can find okay but the presence of flagella and the arrangement of their cell along with flagella remains the same in all this on these cases now <coughs> if we go through the classification scheme then we can see in the, in the treponema pallidum this treponema pallidum is a causative agent of syphilis as we know now syphilis is a, a venereal disease this is also among the sexually transmitted diseases as we know uh, and this syphilis disease is really really dangerous because it, it this disease uh, usually do not set uh, for just just uh, spontaneously because it need time it needs the incubation period to hold uh, on uh, your body so there there are first or primary situations when uh, when they found uh, the environment feasible for them they start to grow and finally it will produce some symptoms or sometimes no symptoms we call the stage is a primary stage of syphilis it just begin uh, like a skin lesions then it finally grows on and on it, it will produce as much more lesions and and cramps uh, and and uh, finally it will go to the stage of secondary syphilis in the secondary syphilis stage what happens uh, sometimes fever nausea flu like symptoms so often people misunderstood this kind of symptoms as flu so they uh, usually uh, do not treat uh, in those situations but uh, this lack uh, lack in their uh, knowledge and treatment this uh, this treponema pallidum start to grow again and finally go through the final stages like tertiary and quaternary stage when uh, they, they start to invade the tissues and just degrade those tissues up sometimes they can attack in the neural tissues and it will create the neurosyphilis that is also very very dangerous and distracting disease it also can be transmitted via the sexual con uh, contacts and that's why safe sex is a must uh, thing uh, for preventing this kind of uh, sexually transmitted diseases okay now uh, if we look for the morphology and structure of uh, this uh, treponema uh, strain and you can find this organism is so thin tightly coiled with the straight end not seen by the stained smear so you cannot see them by usually look at the stained smear or by looking at the uh, using the light microscope by the normal compound microscope we need to visualize these things only under the dark field microscopy so we need to make other uh, field darker uh, then you can see this kind of uh, spirochetes on this uh, microscope now if you do not know what is dark field microscopy please uh, go in my uh, website and look for 
for the dark field microscopy tutorial now uh, now let's move on now we can also find uh, this structure using the fluorescent microscopy so we can tag uh, the fluorescent dye with a uh, with this pyrochid cell and then we can visualize uh, those those fluorescence which is coming out from that spirochids and we can look at them okay now this another important thing about this triponema uh, uh, is that they cannot be grown in in vitro conditions so we need to provide them the original cellular environment like that rabbit epithelial cells and they need a huge amount of replication time or or we, what you can say incubation period uh, about 30 hours or more than 30 hours to grow and reproduce okay and most of them are facultative anaerobes and uh, that means they do not need uh, oxygen for their growth purposes okay uh, so sorry so, uh, yeah you're right so they do not need uh, oxygen for their growth purposes and they can eat, if the oxygen is present that's fine they can use glucose and they can use glucose via oxidative manner okay so that is another important biochemical feature of their cell and as we know they are having the three periplasmic flagell flagella uh, and and these flagella are inserted at each of the cell end or cellular ends as you can see uh, under the outer membrane envelope now if, if we look at the picture it will be more clear than now look at this this is a clearer picture as you can see now this is the actual body of spirochids which is denoting here uh, with yellow color and uh, this is the pink color portion uh, is the outer cell membrane and inside in between this yellow and pink color region is which is a periplasmic space and this periplasmic space is containing this uh, this long flagella as you can see which is just just attaching both of their ends now this is really important for their movement because if the produces flagella from one end it will go to uh, it will not attach to the and uh, it is not attached to uh, uh, the outer uh, the other end then they, this type of coiling structure uh, cannot be achieved so they need to achieve this coiling structure for their movement they need to achieve this screw like structure for their movement and for for that purposes they need to attach both of their ends uh, with this uh, flagella okay and with this periplasmic flagella now you can look uh, here this is the cyto this is the cytoplasmic uh, membrane as you can see here and here is the peptidoglycan layer which is really really thinner but the periplasmic space is much much more uh, uh, profound in this case and here is uh, the flagella is coming out and it is just going to touch to the outer membrane region to some region uh, and uh, it is the generation point like this this is the point of generation this is another point of generation and this picture is zoomed here for this purposes and uh, it, it is uh, it, it, it in turn is going to attach with the other end of the, the of this spirochid okay so this is the morphology of uh, this uh, flagellar assembly now what will vary uh, to the borrelia or the other types of spirochids that you can see the number of flagella but uh, the arrangement of the flagella and the morphology will remain the same now if we look at uh, the triponym and then the flagellar components or the structural proteins are the same like bacteria so we have a flea a, flea m and we have the ms ring we have motor we have rotor and all these things together now if we look at the triponema pallidum uh, through the uh, through the dark field microscopy we can obtain a slide specimen like that now you can see triponema pallidum these are the screw like structures you can see so this is the characteristic structure of spirochids you can see you, you can just identify by looking at it very very easily now if we look at uh, this structure using fluorescence microscopy actually it is much more uh, a attractive picture because fluorescence is always uh, very very attractive indeed because we are using two different color in this case uh, to visualize that now if we are using them uh, for uh, different purposes for staining purposes it cannot be stained in normal way uh, more especially uh, this triponema cannot be visible using normal strain that's why you need to go through either of these techniques to visualize these bacteria now the pathogenesis as we know they have the virulence factors so what are the virulence factors for them it is the first one is the outer cell membrane proteins uh, they are having a particular adhe adhesive proteins so as adhesive proteins are going to promote the adherence uh, to the host cell then they are pro producing hyaluronidase which will uh, which will degrade the hyaluronic acid present in the, in the tissue lining and it will degrade the tissue and in enters in, in inside the tissue the third thing is that they they, they uh, have the coating with the host cell fibronectin proteins and this fibronectin proteins will protect them against 
phagocytosis processes and they are also having the tissue disruption primary result from the host immune response of infection so what happens when they enter in, inside the tissue lining uh, by degrading the tissue lining using hyaluronidase uh, they they cover themselves using fibronectin which is uh, which which they take from host cell and then the host cell machinery host cell uh, immune system is going uh, is trying to go against them and that in turn uh, further weaken down uh, uh, the disease condition further uh, amplify the disease condition of the host okay so if we look at the epidemiology that you can find this this this, uh, this treponema pallidum is having only one host uh, for natural which is the human so though there are no reservoir hosts so the only way of having this disease is the contamination with any human materials okay so the first and foremost thing for that is a safe sex uh, to to prevent this kind of uh, diseases like syphilis okay so that's uh, that's about uh, this uh, Shriponema pallidum. Now let us move on to uh, the next uh, type, which is Borrelia, which is also a gram-negative uh, spiro uh, spirochete and is also having spiral rod-shaped structure. And again, they are possessing flagella, but instead of three flagella, as we can see in case of uh, Shriponema, we are having seven to twenty fl periplasmic flagella. And these flagella are providing them the twisting motility or the screw-like motility from one place to another place. Now they can easily be seen by light microscopy and uh, as we can see in case of uh, the triponema they cannot be visible uh, visualized uh, through light microscopy but we can see this borrelia using light microscopy but we have to stain them with different types of technique which is called the gm staining or right staining instead of uh, the gram staining as uh, they are uh, still gram negative but still uh, we cannot stain them using GM, uh, gram stain we have to stain them using gm or right staining and they are microaerophilic that means they also need very fewer amount of oxygen for their growth so as we can see most of the spirochetes they are not oxygen lovers they uh, some of them are uh, very uh, well when they are low oxygen like microaerophilic like borrelia and some of them uh, won't mind if oxygen present but still they they generally do not love oxygen do not want oxygen uh, for the first uh, uh, for their first preference okay and they need complex nutrients uh, some species could could be cultured uh, but have slow growth rate as you can see 18 hour division time as you can see in case of uh, triponema there are 30 hours of uh, division time or replication time so they are very very slow growing bacteria in normal situations uh, in the in, in vitro situations because we cannot culture them we don't know what kind of nutrients they need because they are really really uh, uh, very very high complex nutrients demanding bacteria species okay now if we look at the structure of Borrelia using the uh, GM sustaining that you can find something like that so you can see this is the Borrelia and these are the cells of host which is infected with this Borrelia now if we if we look at the, this Borrelia using dark field microscopy you can find something like that so it's a very uh, so dark field microscopy is being used because uh, of looking at the structural detail or the morphological detail as you can see here now if we make a cross section of this Borrelia what we can find using the electron microscopy we can see that the, this is the in inner cell uh, inside the cell which is having the cytoplasm and this is the uh, inner cell membrane and this is the outer cell membrane in between this inner cell membrane and outer cell membrane what we are having we are having the periplasmic space and one particular one side of this periplasmic space is little bit more elastic little bit more stretched than the other sides and this uh, this side is actually creating the periplasmic space the area for periplasmic space is just getting increased in this particular periplasmic space portion and this region is uh, full of this flagella so flagella is just coming out and can be transported from one end to another end throughout this uh, stretched end or illustrated end of uh, this uh, end of this borrelia and uh, more and more uh, flagella can pass through this region so as you can see all the other sides are free of flagella but in particular one side as you can see which is really stretched out there are lots of flagella just coming out so if you look at the flagella this will come out like this so uh, uh, above the uh, picture and below the picture so if we, if we construct the image 3d okay 
and now look at the clinical diseases caused by Borrelia. The Borrelia burgdorferi is a causative agent of Lyme disease. Okay, there are lots of different Borrelia species which cause diseases, but Borrelia burgdorferi causes the Lyme disease. Uh, also, the relapsing fever, that means uh, which is simply uh, flu-like symptoms or fever, abdominal cramp, and all these things uh, will come through. And now Borrelia use are uh, actually using uh, techniques of uh, releasing endotoxin uh, to degrade. Uh, the tissue lining to degrade the cell to, to, to go against the host cell instead of exotoxins. As we know, they are uh, gram negative bacteria, so normally gram negative bacteria can produce the exotoxins, but Borrelia uh, usually do not produce exotoxins, they produce endo endotoxins for their uh, degradation purposes. Okay. And uh, immune uh, reactivity against the Lyme disease uh, agents may be responsible for for the clinical disease. And uh, so again, uh, the actual basis of causing this disease or establish this disease is, is lie on the host immune defense. So they produce some materials and they fabricate themselves using the host materials. So host, when they try to go against that, it will just going to destruct uh, the whole balance of the immune system, and that's how uh, the immune system goes down and the disease start to thrive. So that is uh, the way of creating this disease. And if you look at the epidemiology for uh, this Lyme diseases, then you can find there are uh, louse and ticks which are vectors for carrying this kind of Bor uh, Borrelia burgdorferi bacteria. Okay, in human, uh, when you th think about the human diseases, there are body louses which, which just carry these diseases from one place to another, which causes the relapsing fever. And if you think about the Lyme disease, uh, where the reservoir are rodents, deer, domestic pets, and there are ticks uh, of those domestic pets and deers and rodents, which just cause, uh, we, we just carry the bacteria for this Lyme disease. And that's why they need uh, this this louse and ticks uh, to complete their life cycle. Okay. And uh, so, if we look, uh, this uh, ep this uh, re relapsing fever is an epidemic uh, in uh, the Europe last century, and Ethiopia, Rwanda, and uh, in these places, uh, this is an epidemic. And we can also have the epidemic of Lyme disease worldwide, considered uh, the learning vector-borne diseases in U leading vector-borne diseases in U.S. So this Lyme disease is really, really m one of the most uh, major uh, vector-borne diseases. Now let me go to next slide. Okay. Okay. Now we are going to talk about the leptospires. Uh, leptospires. Now leptospires are also thin coiled spirochetes with a hook at one end or both ends. So this is the differing region. This is the unique feature of leptospires from other types of uh, spirochetes. As we know, in all the spirochetes are very thin. They are having the largest periplasmic space. They are having the intracellular. They are having the periplasmic flagella. But in this leptospires, uh, what they are varying, they are they are just varying uh, the production of the hook in the both end of their body. Okay, and they are also motile by using two periplasmic flagella, and those flagella is just coming out from the inner cell membrane, and it will go from uh, from one end to another end. It will contact or attach both ends uh, with each other. Okay, and they are also obligate aerobes. That means they must need oxygen for their growth. So we can see these leptospires are the only one type of bacterial species uh, which are obligate aerobes. That means which need oxygen for their growth. Process purposes. Okay. They grow slowly on medium enriched by the vitamins. They need vitamin B2, B2 and B12 uh, and long chain fatty acids and ammonia uh, for their growth and they need the temperature of 28 to 30 degrees Celsius for throughout the time for, for, their growth, uh, for their growth purposes. Now Leptospira interrogans complex are the human pathogenic strains. This is the type of human pathogenic strains. Uh, interrogans are the human pathogenic strain as you can see. But still they need uh, the right environmental situation for their growth. So though they infect the human body, they need a sequential, a subsequent amount of time and temperature uh, reliability to finally go and thrive in inside the host cell, host body like humans. Okay. There are many, almost you can see, f over 5 lakh severe cases of human leptospirosis around the world and the mortality rate is 2 to 5 percent. That's why that makes the leptospirus a very, very threatening uh, bacteria species. 
And if we look at the structure of this leptospire, this is what we can see in the electron micrograph. We can see the structural detail. This is the 3D structure of uh, the electrospires, uh, the leptospires, and you can see if we look at the structure uh, using the silver staining because we cannot see them using normal staining. So if we look at uh, the silver, uh, look uh, onto them using silver staining, and we can find uh, them that that they are having the spiral structure, but the end of their uh, mm, body we find the presence of these hooks now these hooks are actually uh, helping them to uh, to attach with a particular tissue to invade a particular tissue they they can secrete that hyaluronic acid uh, uh, hyaluronic days to degrade the hyaluronic acid and others uh, to to degrade the tissue cell lining uh, that helps them to finally enter inside the tissue okay so these are the characteristic feature of leptospires. Now uh, look at the pathogenesis and clinical diseases of them. Now the virulence uh, they are processing is dangerous, as we can see. They they just cause uh, cause severe infections. Just for in the first time, uh, the infections just like flu-like or severe systematic diseases. They can produce skin patch. Uh, skin rashes they can also uh, produce the conjunctival uh, suffusion and with jaundice also so this kind of uh, dangerous uh, type of symptoms can be possessed by this uh, leptospires and it will finally uh, 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 make a renal failure or meningitis like these symptoms diseases and finally uh, extensive vasculitis. The, the actual thing this uh, leptospires are intending to do is to disrupt the epithelial uh, lining or the endith sorry, endothelium lining of blood vessels. So actually what happens when uh, these bacteria uh, start to invade into a particular tissue, for example, they start to enter into your uh, kidney and uh, they just start to invade uh, into the kidney tissue and what, ha what, they, uh, does, uh, they, what they do, they, due to the damage of the endothelium layer they, that they cause, what happens the small blood vessels vessel is just going to disrupt and what happens blood is ju just kind of leak out and that's how that organ start to derive of nutrients and all these things so what happens in turn uh, if it infects the kidney you will have a renal failure if it infects your uh, your uh, head your brain it you will have a meningitis and this kind of disease is really really dangerous as you know these are life threatening diseases when somebody uh, having the renal failure or meningitis these are the life threatening diseases and this kind of diseases uh, uh, that's why are really important that that's why we need to talk about this uh, leptospires or this pyro kits which are devastating really we need to look about them and how to control them and uh, and as we know uh, this kind of infection can be transferred from uh, from uh, other type of vectors into human and uh, if we if we are a little bit more concerned about uh, our health uh, we can we can prevent this kind of diseases now if we look at the epidemi uh, epidemiology for them then you can find main reservoir are the rodents so that's why you need to prevent the rodents f to stop this kind of infections so rodents as you can see not only in case of uh, borrelia but also in case of this leptospires these rodents are the causative vectors for carrying this kind of diseases okay especially rats which uh, harbor the bacteria in the renal tubules of the rats and they excrete the bacteria uh, through their urine so somehow when when the, the we are living in the unsanitary conditions where you have a lots of uh, heap of garbages and rats just coming in and they just urinate on them and finally if some somehow uh, we have any contact with that rat urine and uh, some sometimes when the rat if urinates on the water and we drink that water uh, and what happens uh, th th that can be transferred into us not only into us but also other other in mammals uh, uh, suppose uh, your pet can be infected by this and if you further have contact with your pet then you can infect through this so this is an epidemic that can be caused from one place to another place and finally that come to us okay so man and animals such as liver stock or companion animals such as dogs are infected via the bricks and their screen through their mucous membranes so that's why uh, we need to a little, little bit more concern about rodents and to control this kind of leptospirosis diseases that's it and i hope that's going to help you